Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We receive your word. We have ready reception to what's offered us. We thank you that we're going to take hold of your word this day. We thank you that you're opening the eyes of our understanding, giving us a spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of you. As the word is written in our heart and mind, thank you that we're going to take hold of it, we're going to do it, we're going to carry it out. And we're going to see great fruit as we do what you say in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated if you would. We're going to begin sharing with you today on the subject of prayer, as we have announced, a very important subject. As we approach this subject, I strongly encourage you to be teachable, to be receptive to the Word of God, and to forget about what you've heard in the past, because you're going to hear a lot of things if you haven't heard me teach on this subject that are going to be contrary to what you've heard about prayer. And this is very important because we've got to learn God's way of praying, New Testament prayer. First, we've got to realize what prayer is not. It's not just the traditional way that people just pray, pray however they want, whenever they want. No. We must pray according to His Word accurately. And prayer is not just telling God your problem. No. In fact, in Matthew chapter 6, over here in verse 8, the Bible says this, be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. He already knows. So what does telling him our problem have to do with prayer? Nothing. He already knows your problem. What are we praying for? We're praying to release him to bring his promises into manifestation, to bring the answer or to solve the problem that we're dealing with. Prayer is not bombarding the gates of heaven and thinking that you'll open up and listen. No. Prayer is something that we do according to the Word of God in the Spirit. Also, prayer is not asking and asking and asking and asking and asking and just badgering him or trying to convince him, manipulate him, and think that he's going to respond. No. Prayer has nothing to do with any of that. You're not going to be able to manipulate God. God is only going to respond according to His Word. Also, we must realize that prayer is communicating with God. When we communicate with God, we are to communicate with Him in the Spirit. He is a Spirit, and the way that you're going to effectively communicate with God is in the Spirit. We see in Ephesians 6, verse 18, it makes a statement. It says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching therein to with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. All prayer refers to all manner of prayer, all different kinds of prayer. You and I are to pray with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. The word supplication refers to that which is of strong desire with urgent need when you study this verse out, looking up in the lexicons and so forth. You and I are to pray with the idea of strong desire and urgent need as we're praying to see God manifest His promises in our life. And notice it's praying in the Spirit. Now the word S, where it's capitalized in Spirit, has been put in by the translator, but there's no capital letters in the Greek. It, they just thought that it was the right thing to put in. But it, literally it shouldn't be in there because it's talking about praying in the Spirit because all prayer must be in the Spirit if it's going to be effective. In fact, the Bible even says over in 2 Corinthians, Chapter 4, over here in verse 18. While we look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. The things that are seen are that which is of the natural. The things that are not seen are that which is of the Spirit. You and I are to look at the things that are not seen. But the things that are seen are temporal. They're subject to change. But the things that are not seen are eternal. So you and I are going to take aim at the things that are not seen. God is a spirit. You're going to be praying things that are in the realm of the spirit. Prayer not only is to God, but there's also prayers of authority, which we'll be talking about, which are directed against the enemy. In Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 12, the Bible even says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
We are dealing with evil spirits, and through prayers of authority, you're going to be warring against them in the realm of the spirit. We must, must also realize that spiritual warfare is going to take place if you're going to see the will of God come to pass in your life. Colossians 4.12 speaks of Epaphras. It says, He was one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, prayers plural, all different kinds of prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Prayer is going to be necessary to see that come to pass. But I'm going to put the cursor over the word laboring. Notice there's no word that comes up for you who are here for the first time. In the lower window, the Greek word or Hebrew, if you're in the Old Testament, will pop up in the lower window and showing you the number of the strongs and the meaning of it. As I come across to fervently, now you see it pop up below. And it's the word number 75, agonizomai. And this particular word is translated fight and fight the good fight of faith over in, Ephesians, in, in uh, 1 Timothy 6.12. Here it's talking about always laboring fervently, or literally this means to contend with an adversary, contend with an adversary, or fight against an adversary. Always fighting against the adversary for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. It's important that we realize you're going to be praying prayers to God the Father, and you're also going to be praying prayers of authority against the enemy. And it is of a necessity that we learn how to pray all of these prayers accurately, effectively, to see results come forth so that we can all stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Now, when we are praying, we are putting the spiritual laws of God into action into operation that will bring forth the will of God. God's Word is what rules and reigns. His Word is what determines what happens. And we're going to put His Word into operation when we pray the Word of God. In essence, what you're doing is you're making a legal transaction in the Spirit according to spiritual law to bring forth the will of God and see it manifest in a person's life. Also, when you pray, you're going to be putting the angels of God in operation. The angels of God are those who go forth to serve God, to carry out His purposes, to see His promises be done, to war against the evil spirits, and to see God accomplish His will. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 53, Jesus made this statement. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father? and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. Otherwise, he could pray to the Father. The Father would send all the angels that were necessary. A legion was 6,000 plus Roman soldiers. So we're talking about 72,000 angels or plus that would have come on the scene to deal with the situation. That meant Jesus needed the angels to come because the angels are going to minister for us the heirs of salvation. We must also realize that the power of God is resident in His Word. When you pray, you're going to pray the Word, and the Word of God, which has the power of God in it, when you pray the Word, the power of God will be put into operation that is going to bring forth the promises of God. Now, we must realize that there is a change in the covenants. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, it says, in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Are we under the old covenant any longer? No. We are now under the new covenant. Of course, a better covenant with better promises. In the old covenant, the people were not born again. They were not redeemed. They did not have a free approach to God. They were not righteous in spirit. They could not walk in the ways of the Word of God and walk free from sin. They were not uh, sons or daughters in relationship to Him. They were servants, what they were referred to in the Old Testament. They were not all priests. Only one tribe was the priest, which was the tribe of Levi. Not all of them were priests, as we see in the New Testament. They had a very limited approach to God. And when they prayed, they couldn't pray and come into the very presence of God. 
They could only approach through a temple made with hands, and God was not their heavenly Father. But in the New Testament, now we have a better covenant with better promises because we now are in relationship with Him. The New Covenant, now we are born again. God is our heavenly Father. We are now in relationship with Him. We are now sons and daughters. We now have a free approach to God, and we can enter into the presence of God. And now we can come boldly to the throne of grace, and you'll see all these scriptures as we go. Also, we are all priests before God, and the priest is the one who approaches God through the high priest. There's no limits now on us. We have a free approach, and also we now come through a temple made without hands, which is us, because now the presence of God is dwelling in us, and God is our Heavenly Father. So there's a change in covenants. Not only is there a change in covenants and a change in all these areas we've already mentioned, but there's also a change in the way we pray. And this is very important because most everybody in the body of Christ is praying according to Old Testament ways instead of praying according to New Testament ways. And this is very important. If you're going to pray effectively, let's look at some area, ways how they prayed in the Old Testament so you see what we're speaking of. In 1 Kings chapter 8, down here in verse 28, Yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant, to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken to the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee today. Otherwise, he's coming as a servant. He's asking God to hear his cry, to have respect unto his prayer. He has no confidence of what God will do. He's looking for God to be responsive to his prayer. Let's look at another place where they would pray. Over in Psalms 55. Psalms 55, verse 1. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not thyself from thy, my supplication. They're asking him to give ear, to listen to my prayer. They're asking him not to hide from their supplication. That certainly isn't confidence in prayer. They don't know whether God's going to hear them or not. They have no confidence to know whether or not God's going to respond whatsoever. We see in Psalm 61, verse 1, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. Same thing, asking God to pay attention to his prayer and to hear their cry. We see another case illustrating the way that they would pray in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel 1, 27. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I ask of him. They would make petitions, and they would ask of God. That's the way they prayed in the Old Testament. This is the way people still pray in the New Testament today. Unfortunately, they're asking, they're making their petition, they're praying and hoping that God will respond, and wondering whether he's going to hear them, hear them or not. They couldn't come boldly to the throne of grace, remember. They had no free approach to God. But the change has come in the New Testament. Now, we see that God will hear the prayers of the righteous. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12, The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. When someone meets the conditions of being righteous, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears will be open unto their prayers. We also see, in 1 John chapter 5, which we'll be talking about a little bit later, but we just want to look up a couple things here. 1 John 5, 14 says how that if we ask, and we'll be looking at this word a little bit later, anything according to his will, he heareth us. Otherwise, this is now the confidence that we have in him, that God would hear their prayer. Did they have that confidence in the Old Testament? No. Can we have that confidence, and are we to have that confidence in the New Testament? Yes. In fact, if we know that he hears us, we, whatsoever we ask, we know we have the petitions we desire to, but we know we have everything that we prayed. That is confidence. If God hears us, we know we have them. And we want to be sure that he hears us. Most people think that God hears every prayer that they pray. According to this scripture, if he heard their prayer, he, they have everything they pray. Well, we know that's not happening to people. So they must not quite be praying the way they need to. It's very important that we pray accurately and effectively. Another scripture that's important for us to realize, which we've quoted, referred to in, here, but here it is in Hebrews 4.16. 
Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Notice, you and I can come boldly to the throne of grace, confidently, freely. They couldn't do that in the Old Testament, but now we can do that in the New Testament. Now, it's important that we understand how to pray New Testament prayer. And we see that Jesus spoke in response to what the people said to teach them about prayer. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1, it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. They wanted to know how John was teaching his disciples. Well, Jesus didn't respond to them and teach them how John was teaching his disciples. Instead, he responded to them, but he taught them New Testament prayer. Because what did Jesus come to do? He came to bring the New Testament into being. Here is what he said to them. This is over in Matthew's account. In Matthew 6, 9, he said, After this manner, therefore pray you, Our Father, which art in heaven. Was God their heavenly Father in the Old Testament? No. What's he teaching? He's teaching prayer in the New Testament, and now they're going to pray to the Father. Hallowed be thy name. They're now going to pray in the name, and thy kingdom come, thy will be done as it is in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. They're going to begin to pray things that are going to bring the kingdom, the rule and the reign of God, and the will of God into manifestation. They didn't even know anything about this whatsoever. So it was brand new to them of what Jesus was beginning to pray and to show them. Now, in John chapter 16, John 16, verse 23, it says this, In that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. This is Jesus speaking. And this is a very important passage of Scripture because he's showing you the change in prayer. Notice this first verse as we look again. In that day, what day is he talking about? The day after the resurrection. You shall ask me nothing. Who's doing the speaking? Jesus. Are we supposed to pray to Jesus now? No. You don't ask Jesus anything. That's what he said. So everybody who's praying to Jesus is praying contrary to the New Testament and praying in error, and they won't get an audience with God because they're praying incorrectly. The word ask is a word arateo. If you notice below number 2065. And it means really to ask or to request something. So he's saying, you're not going to ask or request of me anything. That's the way they did things in the Old Testament. And that was their way they used to be where they used to ask and request of things. He says, verily, verily, truly, truly, saying it twice, emphasizing it, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. What's this say? Now we're going to pray to the Father. We're not praying to Jesus. I hear ministers praying to Jesus. They're praying in error. Now we pray directly to the Father, and he said, in my name, which is in the name of Jesus. In the New Testament, we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. And it says, he, referring to who? The Father will give it you. Who's going to give you the things you pray? Your Heavenly Father, because now you're in relationship with Him. But there's another thing that we must look at here. We showed you the word ask, erateo, if you see it below, number 2065. The next word ask, you'd think it'd be the same word, because you think ask must just mean ask or request. I put the cursor over the word number of this one, and notice it's a different word below. It's number 154. It is a different Greek word. This word is aratio, meaning to ask or request. This word is aiteo, number 154. Now, this particular word, we're going to go to another screen to show you what this word means because in the Bible Works program, which we use, which is outstanding for study, they have done a poor job on the meaning here. And I'll prove it to you and show you what I mean. Because they say it means ask, beg, call for, crave, desire, require. I want you to notice one thing. Notice that every one of those words, ask, beg, call, crave, desire, require, go up. They go right down the alphabet, don't they? A, B, C to D, and then eventually R. 
It's in alphabetical order, isn't it? Because it's significant, which we'll show you in a moment, of what this is talking about. It is not the meaning of the word. Instead, it is the word, ateo, which has been translated in the King James Version, in English, ask. It's also been translated beg. It's also been translated call for. It's also been translated crave. It's also been translated desire. It's also been translated require. How do we know that? Let's just look a little bit farther down on here. Notice the usage. See the usage? This is the usage in the authorized version, which is the King James. Notice what it says. Ask, desire, beg, require, crave, call for. In other words, this word iteo has been translated these ways, these different words, in the, New, in the New Testament, in the King James Version. Does that mean that that's what it means? No, that's just the way it's been translated. So that's not the meaning. So you clearly can see that it's not the real meaning of the, ver of the word. It's simply how it's been translated into King James. Now, in this particular program called Lightning Bible Program, this is a particular program which shows Strong's Concordance. This is Strong's Concordance reproduced in this particular program. And it shows a comparison of similar words and gives you what literally the word means. Now, first of all, remember back here, we'll go back to Bible works for a moment. The first word ask was number 2065, right? The second word ask is number 154. Let's go over here to this one. In fact, I don't know why we're not seeing the whole thing. We should be seeing the whole thing. We're not seeing the first part of it. Let me go back and hit this again. This is the CERT program to be able to bring this up. We'll go to 154, first of all. That's number 54. It is not showing the whole thing for some reason. Hmm. I don't know why it's do, not doing that. Because it's miss, you're missing the first part. Hmm. Well, let me tell you what it says. You can't see it here. There's a one above this. It says 2065. And number 2065 says, request as a favor. That's what the word erateo means. Request as a favor. Unfortunately, this is not showing the whole thing. Normally it does. I don't know why. I must not know. don't know how to make that change. But I want you to look at this one, number 154, which is the word aratio, which means strictly a demand of something due. A demand of something due. That is a very important point. In other words, let's go back over here. The first one does mean a request as a favor. That's what it says in Strong's, number 2065. He says, in that day, you're going to request as a favor of me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto whatsoever you shall demand of what's due you of the Father in my name, he will give it you. That is a totally different concept than asking or petitioning. But that's what the word means in the Greek. A demand of something due you. The word has been ch changed from erateo to New Testament prayer, aiteo. And this is very important. What are we doing when we're making a demand of something to us? First of all, you're not demanding of God. You can't make God do anything. It's not a demand in the sense of trying to force him to do something. It is a legal term according to spiritual law. When you make a demand of something according to a legal term, you are demanding that which belongs to you or your rights or promises or privileges that belongs to you. In fact, I learned this even before I became uh, in, the, in the ministry, long before. Because before I went in the ministry, I was an insurance adjuster for five years after I graduated from college, before I was called in the ministry. And during that time, we would always be recovering monies that were due us called subrogation from people that owed us money. And in doing so, we would write them letters, and we were always writing, we request that you send us the money according to our subrogation rights to return it to us. It was belonged to the insurance company. 
A letter came down from the home office one day that went to every single of the policy service offices. And this particular letter said, do not say I request when you write anybody about monies that belong to you legally. Instead, you are to write, I demand that you send such and such amount of money, because they said that is the proper way according to leg legality, according to legal ways, in order to see something be sent. Now, so I learned that we could make a demand of what's due us for our rights to be brought into manifestation for us. And that's the same principle that's really being said here. Whatsoever you shall demand of what's due you of the Father in my name, he will give you. Now, what are we, why are we doing this? Well, first of all, you must understand that all the promises of God have already been given you. Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. All the blessings of the things we want to receive from the Lord, and notice it says all blessings, so this isn't some of them. And notice what it says, half blessed. That's past tense. That means everybody that is in Christ Jesus has already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That means they already belong to us. Since they've already been given to us, if we come to the Father, are we going to come to ask Him to give us those blessings? No, they've already been given to us. Instead, we're going to do something to release those blessings that have already been given to us to come into manifestation in our life. They've already been given to us, so we aren't going to ask him to give us something that he already gave us to us. No. Instead, we're going to do something that is going to release these blessings. By the way, all the promises of God have already been given to us in Christ. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yea, yes, and in him amen, so be it, unto the glory of God by us. All promises have already been given to us, and they're yes. They're not maybe and no. God doesn't say no regarding the promises of God. He doesn't say maybe, I'll do it for you, and maybe I won't. No. He says yes. All the promises are ours. You've got to know that. Every promise belongs unto you. Therefore, since the promises belong unto you, they've already been given to you, and now you are to see these promises come into manifestation, you're going to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. You're going to make a demand of what's due you, and he will give it to you. How do we make a demand of what's due us? Now, by the way, what's due us? All the promises that have been given to us. Now, are you trying to make God give it to you? No. He already gave it to you. This is simply the means, according to spiritual law, to release what's already been given to you to come into manifestation in your hands. Okay? It's similar somewhat to writing a check to see monies be released from the bank. You have a checking account. It has your money in it. It belongs to you. When you write a check, our checks used to be, used to say, and if you've been around for a while, you remember this, checks used to say, pay to the order of so-and-so on legal demand. Anybody remember that? They changed it, but they used to say, pay on legal demand. They got rid of that part. But that was really the way you would do things according to legal demand. You're making a legal demand of the bank for the release of your money that belongs to you to be sent to wherever it's to go. So. And when you make a legal demand of what's due you from the bank, you're not asking the bank to send your money. The money is already yours. You are making a legal directive according to law for it to be sent, to be released on your behalf for your benefit in some aspect. Well, here, think of it this way. All the promises of God and all the blessings are, so to speak, in the bank of heaven. And they belong to us. And what are we doing? We are coming to the Father in the name of Jesus to see the promises that have already been given to us be released to us for our benefit. And so instead of asking and requesting as a favor, now we're coming boldly to the throne of grace, directly to the Father, through the name of Jesus, who is the high priest. And you and I are coming as priests, 
and we're making a demand of what's due us, which is the promises of God that belong to us. And that is very important. That's why he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall make a demand of what's due you, the Father in my name, he'll give it you. Then he goes on and he says in verse 24, Hitherto, hitherto means up to this time, or until this time, which is talking about the time when he's talking about here, he's referring to what's the New Testament prayer, the age that's going to come. Up to this time, have you, Iteo, made a demand of what's due you, nothing in my name. You have not made a demand of what's due you of anything in my name. Why? Because God wasn't their heavenly father. They weren't in relationship with him. They had no free approach to God. The promises didn't belong to them as far as already given to them that they could just come and take hold of them whenever they wanted. Up to this time, you've made, you have not, you've made a legal demand, a demand of what's due you of nothing in my name. Make a demand, ask as I tell you, make a demand of what's due you. Make a demand of what's due you, something due you. And you shall receive that your joy may be full. This is the next word we need to look at. There are two different major words for receive in the Greek. One of them is a word dekamai, and you've heard us talk about this before. Dekamai is a passive reception. You're waiting for something to come for, to you, and you have nothing to do with seeing it come to you. It's a passive reception. The other word is lambano, which is a, the opposite, a active reception, a self-prompted taking hold of, where you do something to cause that to come to you. The word used here is lambano, which means you shall take hold of, because it means to take or to lay hold on something. So what he's saying in this verse is, hitherto or up to this time, have you made a demand of nothing in my name, of what's due you, of nothing in my name, Make a demand of what's due you, and you shall take hold of it, that your joy may be full. Why is it necessary for this to be lambano, of taking hold of it? Because since the promises have been given unto you, you are taking hold of what belongs to you to see it come into manifestation in your life. Such as when you write a check to the bank. You're taking hold of that which belongs to you to be either come to you or to be sent wherever it's supposed to go. You're taking hold of that, and that's what you're doing to release it. So this is a very important principle. And this is the way you pray in the New Testament. Now, this isn't some isolated place. You might think, well, is this just one time where he said that? No. It's in all the major prayer scriptures throughout the entire New Testament. Matthew chapter 6 in verse 8, and we're going to be looking at ones that use Iteo and Lombano. You're going to see this. Matthew 6, 8. Be ye not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Remember we quoted this scripture earlier? What's the word ask? Iteo. Not request or petition, but make a demand of what's due you. Before you make a demand of what's due you, because who are you approaching? Your Father. That's New Testament prayer. See, Jesus was in the Old Testament era but he taught New Testament prayer because that's what he was bringing into manifestation that was going to come into manifestation at the time of Pentecost when the, when the birthday of the church would occur. Look at this over here in Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. The prayer of agreement. Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall, I tell, make a demand of what's due me. It shall be done for them of my Father. Who does it? The Father. Remember, the Father is the one who's given you these things, which is in heaven. Therefore, what are we doing? We are making a demand of what is due us. How do you make a demand of what's due you? You bring the scripture promise that belongs to you. What is due you? The promise of God. So what am I going to do? I'm going to quote the scripture promise of God, what it says, and I'm bringing that to him, which already has been given to me, making a demand of what's due me based on the scripture promise. This is why, what do you pray? Do we pray the problem? No. We pray the word. Why do we pray the word? Because we're bringing the scripture promise, which is that which belongs to us, and we're going to take hold of it to see it come into manifestation in our life. Look at the scripture in Matthew 21, verse 22. Look what he says. All things, whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. 
Now let me tell you what traditional teaching has said about this verse. It is said, whatsoever you ask in prayer, I'm going to ask, request, and petition in prayer, believing, I'm going to believe, and then it says, you shall receive, and they think of receive as, I'm going to get it. It's going to come to me. In other words, I'm going to ask and petition or request, I'm going to believe, you know, just be sure I've got to believe, and then I'm going to get it. Is that what it's saying? No, it's saying absolutely the opposite. Whatsoever you shall iteo, make a demand of what's due you in prayer. Believing you shall lambano, take hold of it. That is totally different. In other words, because you believe, believing isn't going to get it done. Believing is just part of it. You believe, what do you do? You take hold of it. I believe that promise is for me. I'm taking hold of that promise, taking hold of it to see it come into manifestation in my life. Let's look over at Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, in verse 24. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. Now, this say, well, I don't see the word about prayer as, as ask or I tell anywhere in here, ask. Well, remember, sometimes it was translated desire, if you remember. You put the cursor over the word desire, it's iteo. Normally translated ask, but for some reason translated desire here. Desire means what I wish or what I want. It shouldn't have been translated that way. It's not even a good translation. In fact, many people have used this prayer as a catch-all for anything. Whatsoever, I, don't have, I don't have a scripture on it, but I got Mark 11, 24. Whatsoever I desire, I desire such and such. So I desire whatever it is I desire. My heart's content, you know. When you pray, believe that you receive them and you'll have them. Well, it doesn't work that way. It's not what you desire, whatever my heart's content, whatever I want. It's whatever I, I was demand of what's due me. And what is, the, the, what is due you? The scriptural promises. In other words, you can't pray something contrary to the word. If you pray things contrary to the word, it's not going to get any audience with God. Because what belongs to you? All the promises, all the blessings that have been given to you. What things, whoever you make a, de a demand of what's due you, when you pray, believe that you lombano them, take hold of them, and you shall have them. This is the prayer of faith. So you're to make a demand of what's due you and take hold of this as you believe you take hold of it. Another thing that's important, there's been much teaching in the body of Christ that is said that you pray one time. If you pray more than one time, why would you need to do that? You must have been doubt and unbelief. If you believe what you prayed the first time, you should see it come to pass. That's the prevailing teaching from what's commonly referred to as word of faith teaching from people of that persuasion. And they say, pray, believe you receive, you should believe you receive, it should be done right then and there. How many are aware of that kind of teaching prevalent out there in the body of Christ? All right. Notice it said, believe that you received, not believe that you received, believe you received one time, believe you receive then you'll have them. Let's look at something for a moment. When we put the cursor over the word desire, because many, many people teach that you just pray one time. The word, make a which is iteo, make a demand of what's due you, is in the present tense. The present tense means continuous repeated action. That means what things, whoever you make a demand of what's due you, you're to do it continuously and repeatedly, not just one time. And also, notice, it's in the middle voice. The middle voice, by the way, for you, uh, just here for the first time, the tenses are very important, and the present tense means continuous repeated action. Very important to see that. The voices are important as well. There's the active voice, the middle voice, and the passive voice. The active voice means the subject is doing the action. The passive voice means the subject is being acted upon by somebody else. The middle voice, which is what you hear here, see here, means the subject is doing the action for his own benefit. He's doing it for himself. And that's what's used here. This thing, so it says, what things, soever you make a demand of what's due you for yourself, you do this continuously, because it's present tense. Let's look at the next word.
pray. How about the tense of this verb? Happens to be a participle, and here it is, present tense, meaning I'm going to continuously and repeatedly be praying, not once, not as one-time stuff. How about the word believe, the stuo? Interesting, this one, two things we want to comment on, the tense voice and mood. Present tense, meaning it's continuous repeated action, isn't it? Not one time. And also notice, it's an imperative, it's a command. You don't try to believe, you are commanded to believe. You believe, I believe, every promise. I believe every promise in obedience to God, what God says, and I'm commanded to do it, and I'm not about to doubt for one second. The word receive, lambano. What about this one? It also is in the present tense. That is very important. Because the present tense means continuous repeated action. So what does this say? What things soever you make a demand of what's due you, when you pray, believe you take hold of them, and you shall have them, and you do this continuously and repeatedly until you see the desired results. Now that is totally contrary to what most people have been teaching out there. Most people teach, pray, believe you receive, thank him it's already done. Contrary to the word of God, false teaching in the body of Christ. It is not the truth. You pray the prayer of faith continuously and repeatedly. In Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, verse 9, here is another place. I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. What is it? What's the word ask? I tell you, demand of what's due us. Let's look at the next verse. Everyone that asketh, receiveth. He that seeketh, findeth. Him that knocketh, it shall be opened. What's the word ask? I tell you. What's the word receive? Lombano. What does that tell you? Everyone who makes a demand of what's due them takes hold of it. It's telling you what you do in prayer. And also, let's look at these particular words as far as their tense. The word ask, present tense. Meaning the one is going to continually be making a demand of what's due him. How about the word receive? Would we just continually make a demand of what's due us and then we're going to receive, you know? What about that? That also is in the present tense. That is very important. Because that means we're going to be continually taking hold of it. So this literally says, everyone who makes a demand of what's due him takes hold of it, and he does it continuously and repeatedly until he sees the desired result. Totally contrary to what has been taught in the body of Christ. Anybody have an Amplified Bible here? The Amplified says this. It says, everyone who asks and keeps on asking receives. You familiar with that? They got one part right as far as the tense, the asking. Asks and keeps on asking, because it is present tense. But they must have ignored the receiving and for, refused to look at that verse or ignored it or whatever, because it should have said, if they translated it correctly, who asks and keeps on asking, receives and keeps on receiving kind of a thing. But that wouldn't make sense to them because they don't understand what they're talking about because they were still back and asked because they didn't get the right word translated correctly. And so it's a mess. I'm going to keep asking and asking and asking and asking and I'll receive. That's what the Amplified tells you, which is totally false. Instead, it is saying, everyone who makes a demand of what's due me, I take hold of it and I do it continuously and repeatedly until I see the desired results. Another place in Luke 11 that we have used this word, Iteo, where it says, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Notice, this is talking about coming to your heavenly father. So who has a relationship to God as his heavenly father? Believers, born again believers, right? All right, a born again believer is instructed to come to his heavenly father and ask him to give him the Holy Spirit. Now, is the Holy Spirit one of the promises? Yes. Is that already been given to us legally in Christ? Yes, I'll be borrowed, it's one of the promises. So are we supposed to ask, request the father to give us the Holy Spirit? No. How do you know? Because the word is Iteo. How much more should the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that make a demand of what's due them? In other words, the Holy Spirit, which is one of the promises of God for the person who wants they're born again, is you make a demand of what's due you. By the way, another thing that's important here. 
This proves also that the Holy Spirit is not received at the point of salvation. Because what happens when you're born again? You get the Spirit of Jesus Christ, and you're now in relationship to God as your Heavenly Father, right? What did you get? The Spirit of Jesus Christ. Did you get the Holy Spirit when you were born again? No. How do you get the Holy Spirit after you're born again? You come to your Heavenly Father, you make a demand of what's due you to give you the Holy Spirit. Why would we be coming to our Father to give us the Holy Spirit? Because we don't have the Holy Spirit yet. Therefore, the believer comes to the Father to make a demand of what's due him for him to give him the Holy Spirit, and of course he will give him. This is a very clear text showing that the Holy Spirit is received after a person is born again, and that it is one of the promises of God that belongs to you, and you don't need to ask and ask and ask, or, or you know, request and request, or as they, some groups out there, tarry and tarry and tarry for the Holy Spirit forever, waiting for it, which is total error. All kinds of groups, Pentecostal groups and apostolic groups, and to this, and it's total error. Instead, you're simply to take hold of the promise of the Holy Spirit, and he will come to dwell in you immediately. Let's look at another scripture. John chapter 14. And these are all the major prayer scriptures throughout the New Testament. John 14, 13. Whatsoever you shall ask, I tell. In my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So we're going to make a demand of what's due us in the name of Jesus. And he says, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified. Jesus is going to see it come to pass. Because when, any time you do something in the name of Jesus, he's going to make sure it gets done. Because what you bring to him, bring to the Father through the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, is coming through the high priestly ministry. And what does Jesus do? He takes that which you bring to him, and he confesses it before the Father, and confesses it before the angels, and sorts to see that come to pass. If you shall ask, I tell you, anything in my name, I will do it. This is making a demand of what's due you of anything. Now, this is not talking about anything I want. Because it already says, I tell you, I demand of what's due you. So that already has limited to all the things that are due you. But what it's saying is, if you shall make a demand of, of what's due you, anything, which means all the promises of God, any promise of God that's due you, every single one of them, you can take hold of them all. I will do it. Let's look at John chapter 15, the verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask, I tell you, what you will, and it shall be done unto you. But again, this is implying the fact that because it's a demand of what's due you, and what's due you? Only the promises of God. What you will, otherwise you do it at your will. Say, so you mean I can willingly come and make a demand of what's due me and take hold of the promises? Yes, at your will. But not according to whatever I want. It ought to be in line with the word of God, for the promises of God, and it shall be done. Verse 16, look what he says. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And that whatsoever you shall, I tell, of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Pretty consistent throughout. We haven't seen one place where it's used arateo about requesting or petitioning anymore, have we? You may be thinking of some scriptures. We'll get to those very shortly. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Here's another place. Now unto him that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask, I tell you, make a demand of what's due us, or think according to the power that worketh in us. We're the one that puts the power up in operation as we make a demand of what's due us. Here's the next one we want to look at, Philippians. And you might say, well, I was waiting for you to get around to this one, because if you know your scriptures, you might know you're saying we don't petition or request anymore. Here's one that says request. Philippians 4, 6, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. I've had people say, hey, the Bible says request, so I can still request if I want. You can do anything you want, but you're not going to get anywhere. What's the word request? Itema, which is 155, which is right next door to 154. It has the same meaning. It's just another form of Iteo, 155. Which means, again, it's making a demand of what's due us. 
And everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your, let you, let your making of demands of what's due you be made known unto God. Do we pray the problem? No. We pray the answer, which is the word of God. Here's another one, Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire. There's that word desire. What is it? I tell. Make a demand of what's due you. That you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in knowledge of God. These, this is a prayer, a scriptural prayer that you can pray for anybody in the body of Christ. We're going to make a demand of what's due us that we might be filled with the knowledge of his will. This is a good prayer to pray. Stick your name in there. Stick somebody's name in there. I pray for so-and-so, that so-and-so might be filled with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, and that so-and-so might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, that so-and-so would be fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's part of our demand of what's due us as a Christian. So we can pray. We're praying the answer, see? Let's look at another scripture over in James, chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him iteo, make a demand of what's due him of God, because wisdom is one of the promises. You're you can see wisdom, you can take hold of it. That gives to all men liberally, and abradeth not, it shall be given him. But let him iteo, make a demand of what's due you, in faith, nothing wavering. You make a demand of what's due you because you know it belongs to you. How could you ever waver? I didn't go to the bank and say, Mr. Banker, please give me the money out of my checking account. Now, I'm not sure if he's going to do it or not, you know. No, I'm not wavering. I know it's mine. I know it's going to happen because I understand what a check is. It's a legal instrument. It's going to release it. It belongs to me. So I'm, not, I'm never going to waver when I make a legal demand of God because I know it's dealing with things that already belong to me that are going to be released to me. He goes on in the next verse and he says, Let not that man think that he shall receive... Lombano, take hold of anything of the Lord. In other words, when I make a demand of what's due me in faith for wisdom, I take hold of that as long as I'm not wavering. There's no reason for us ever to waver concerning the promises of God. James chapter 4, verse 2. You lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, you fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not, I tell. You have not because you don't make a demand of what's due you. Many people don't have the promises that belong to them because they haven't made a demand of what's due them. Then he goes on in the next verse, though, and he says, you make a, ask, make a demand of what's due you, which is the correct, and receive, lombano not. Why didn't they take hold of it? Why couldn't they take hold of it? Because you make a demand of what's due you amiss, that you may consume it upon your own lust. Otherwise, it is possible... For you to make a demand of what's due you according to the promise of God, but with a wrong motivation. Not for what God wants, but for my loss. No, you don't do things for your loss. Wrong motivation, you won't be able to take hold of it. That shows you that when you pray, you can't say, well, I'm making my legal demand for a billion dollars, you know. You know, and I, it's mom going to get it. I take hold of it, it's going to happen. You're doing it for consuming on your own loss. You know, so I can go buy all the things I want to buy and all these kind of things. So motive is all tied into this. Look at 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3, we'll look at a couple scriptures. First of all, in verse 20. If our heart condemn us, why would our heart condemn us if we got sin in our life? God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, why would that be? because I've confessed my sin, my heart's right and perfect towards God. Then have we confidence toward God. In other words, you will not have confidence toward God in prayer, which is what you're going to see in the next verse, unless your heart's right with Him. Look at, look at the next verse. And whatsoever we, I teo, make a demand of what's due us, we, lambano, take hold of Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. So this also shows you there are some considerations. You just can't pray for whatever you want and not be walking in his ways. It's not going to happen. We can make a demand of what's due us and we take hold of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. That's why our heart's right with him. So otherwise, you've got to be walking right if you're going to see results. 
1 John chapter 5, verse 14. Look what it says. And this is the confidence that we have in him, and I'm going to read this in the two verses in the King James, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. I want you to notice, we got one ask in verse 14. We got another word, ask, in verse 15. And we got a word, petitions, and we got a word, desired. Four different words. Sounds like, you know, what are, what are all these about? Now we got the petitions. Most everybody's out there pet petitioning. I'm going to put my petition up to God. That's what they did in the Old Testament. What's petition mean? Ask, request, and see if he'll do something. Let's find out what these words are. This is the confidence that we have in him that if we, I tell you, make a demand of what's due us, anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he heareth whatsoever we, I tell you, make a demand of what's due us. We know that we have the itema, the one right next to it, 154, the demands that we have made a demand of him, that we desired, remember it was translated that a lot of times, iteo, of him. In other words, the word iteo three times in this form of iteo, itema, four, is used once, so we have four times this word is used in this verse, yet it's translated three different things. You'd never figure this out in a million years about what it really says unless you look it up in the Greek and understand what the words mean. This is why it's extremely imperative that we look things up. So look what it says. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we make a demand of what's due us of anything, and here's qualifying, what is it, what's anything that we can make a demand of what's due us? According to his will. What's his will? The word of God, the covenant that we have. He heareth us. Now that's good news. That means that God hears us if, and that's the qualification, we make a demand of what's due us of anything according to his will. This means that God hears the prayers that are prayed to the Father that are bringing the Word of God with the promise of God that's, that belongs to us, that's due us, according to His will. Which also means He doesn't hear prayers that are contrary to His Word. He doesn't hear them. He's not responding to them. He doesn't hear them. They didn't get anywhere. They just went out in thin air. Well, certainly God must have heard me. And we're talking about Him hearing you to respond. He didn't. I mean, think of it this way. You're on the internet. You type in the right address, you get to the right place. You type in the wrong address, you don't get to the right place. You know, they, that place didn't hear you because you didn't do it according to exactly what you need to be doing. Well, we got to make a demand of anything according to his will, which is the word. You pray contrary to the word, he doesn't hear you. You didn't get there. You pray in line with the word, he hears you. Now, and if we know that he hears us, you can't just assume he hears you. You've got to know he hears you. If we know that he hears us, how do we know he heard us? Because we made a demand of what was due us according to his will. That's how, because in the previous verse. We know that we have. You mean to tell me that I can know that I have what I prayed? Absolutely. Well, I hope I have what I prayed. No, I can know I have what I prayed. We know that we have the demands that we made that were due us of him, that we made a demand of what was due us of him. In other words, this is literally saying this. This is the confidence that we have in him. If we make a demand of what's due us of anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we've made a demand of what's due us, we know that we have the de demands due us, that we made a demand of what was due us of him. That is confidence in prayer. And notice, if you know he heard you, you know you have it. It's not, I hope I have it. I wonder if I'll have it. No, this is an extremely important verse for you to get a hold of. This verse will absolutely revolutionize your prayer life if you get a hold of what's being said. No more do we hope I got what I have. I know I have what I prayed. In other words, if you pray accurately to the Father in the name of Jesus according to the will of God, 
bring in the scriptural promise that belongs to you, what's due you, making a demand of what's due you, to the Father in the name of Jesus. You know that he heard you, and you know you have those legal demands that you made a legal demand of him. That is powerful, and that is New Testament prayer. Otherwise, we just don't pray and just hope something will happen. That's Old Testament prayer. Most everybody in the body of Christ is praying a bunch of Old Testament prayer stuff. Or some of the ones who've understood about making a demand of what's due you, they got off track and are praying the one time only, believe I receive, it's done, that's it. And missing the whole boat. Instead of praying continuously and repeatedly taking hold of the promise until we see the result come into manifestation. In other words, we have a great problem in prayer being taught not only in the United States, but in the world. So I've taught this over in Africa and other nations where I've been to. They don't know any of this stuff. Of course, they don't even have computers or strong concordances to even know these things. But some, some of the languages have some, somewhat known this. Because in the French language, the LSG translation, the word used for, which is Iteo in all their translations, is the word D-E-M-A-N-D-E-R-E, -E -E, demandery, if anybody knows French which would tell you, demand. It is the word. They translate it correctly, so they'd figure it out, all the French-speaking ones. When I went on and taught that over in the French-speaking nations, they understood that because they saw demandery. But in the English language, without looking it up, we don't have any idea of what's going on. So we have a major problem in the body of Christ because people have not understood this. We'll look at one other scripture regarding that doesn't use Iteo, but it uses Lombano that we looked at before. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Look what it says. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain. The word obtain is lambano. That we may take hold of mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Mercy is one of the promises of God. God's mercy is available for you. You can take hold of his mercy. Remember what those blind men were calling out for us? Have mercy on us, thou son of David. They were looking for healing. Healing is mercy. You can take hold of healing mercy from the Lord because it belongs to you. You can come and take hold of that because it belongs to you. So, let's, back, let's, let's give you an example of how this would work. Here it says we take hold of mercy. Well, how do I know that mercy is a promise that belongs to me? Well, we've got to look at the scripture and find one. Here's a scripture. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 10 says this. In time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Notice past tense. Now what is that? That is a scripture promise that belongs to us as a Christian. We have obtained mercy. Now do I just speak that scripture and then mercy is going to be released on my behalf? No. That's just a scripture promise. This is what you're going to iteo make a demand of what's due you. In other words, if I want to see mercy, what am I going to do? I'm going to say, Father, in the name of Jesus, your word says, I'm bringing the scripture promise, your word says that I have obtained mercy according to 1 Peter 2.10. That belongs to me in Christ. That's one of the scripture promises, one of the blessings that belongs to me. Therefore, because this is the scripture promise which I'm bringing before you, making my demand of what's due you, I am coming boldly to the throne of grace, and I am now taking hold of your mercy in the name of Jesus. Otherwise, because the mercy belongs to me, have obtained your legal right, I now um, obtain, take hold of mercy in order to see it be manifest. This is the Lombano part. So if you're going to pray accurately and effectively, you're going to pray to the Father, in the name of Jesus, you're going to make a demand of what's due you by bringing the scripture promise, and then you're going to take hold of that promise in order to see it come into manifestation. And you're not going to pray that once. You're going to continually pray that until you see the manifestation of the promise come forth in your life. That is so important. We had you, many people praying the prayer for a job. They simply prayed that prayer. Well, we brought, we brought all the scriptures. 
If you examine that prayer, it has scripture after scripture. Everything we pray is a scripture that we're praying, which is what says what God will do. So we're praying the word, which is making a demand of what's due us. And then we believe we took hold of that job that God has for us in that prayer. And then we continually told everybody, pray it every day. Pray it without ceasing, continuously repeated action. Watch, and then, of course, you're going out to seek to find at the same time. Your, your part, go out and obtain it, in the sense. But then the spirit, we were taking hold of it, and the angels were going before you, preparing your way, going out to cause this thing to come to pass. And we've seen people get jobs that prayed the prayer because they put God in operation. In other words, same thing in the area of healing. In the area of healing, you would simply say, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, your word says, I'm bringing the scriptural promise, my demand of what's due me. By whose stripes you were healed. What is that? That's a past tense declaration showing the scripture promise that belongs to us. All the past tense scriptures are the, are the promises of God that belong to us according to the will, so we're making a demand of what's due us. By bringing that. Your, your word says, and also I'm going to say also what Jesus did. Your word says himself took our infirmities, bare our sicknesses. Your word says you're the Lord who heals me. Exodus 15, 26. Your word says, you heal us of all of our diseases. Psalms 103, verse 3. Your word says, by his stripes you were healed. Legally it belongs to me in Christ. 1 Peter 2, 24. Therefore, I come boldly to the throne of grace and I take hold of your healing mercy, because mercy is healing from the blind men and all the other cases. And I thank you that your healing mercy is flowing into my body now. And I keep saying that and keep declaring that. And as I keep saying it, healing power keeps flowing and flowing and flowing into your body to heal and restore you. The prayer of faith is continuous and repeated until we see the desired result. And this is so important. As you learn to pray accurately and effectively in line with the word, you're going to see results. So we've introduced this today. We've talked about some major things that are important. What do we do? We don't pray to Jesus. We don't request, ask, petition. We pray to the Father. In the name of Jesus. Why? Because you and I are priests coming through the high priestly ministry of Jesus. And what do we do? We're going to pray the pro promise of God, not the problem. We're going to pray the word, bringing the scripture promise according to his will, the word of God. And then we believe that we take hold of that, Lombano, to release that to come into manifestation. And we continually pray that until we see the results. It's really very simple. The promise is yours. Heavenly Father, your word says, I believe that I take hold of this. And I thank you that it's flowing, that's occurring in my life as I continue to take hold of it. I keep praying it and praying it until I see the desired results. Now, if it's something that happens immediately, you don't need to pray it again. For instance, like the Holy Spirit. You make a demand of what's due you for the Father to give you the Holy Spirit, he'll give you the Holy Spirit immediately. The Holy Spirit you believe you receive, the Holy Spirit comes right into you immediately. You don't need to pray it again once it's been manifest. But things that you need to continually pray until you see the desired result, you keep praying until the desired result is accomplished. This will revolutionize your prayer life once you put it in operation. And you'll be praying scripturally accurate New Testament prayer. You're going to see results. And you're going to come to the place of having absolute confidence that he hears you and that you know that you have what you prayed. I'm not hoping and wondering if I got it. Remember, the guy who wonders, he can't take hold of anything of the Lord. So you've got to be in faith. When you're in faith, the prayer of faith, and that's important. You take the prayer of faith, but you continually pray it until you see the desired results. Say this to me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word and the revelation of New Testament prayer. I thank you. There's a change in covenants. I'm in the new covenant. As a child of God, God is my heavenly Father. Now, in the New Testament, I do not ask Jesus anything. I now pray to the Father, in the name of Jesus, make a demand of what's due me, 
take hold of that continuously and repeatedly, praying that prayer until I see the desired results, the manifestation of the promise. I thank you, Lord, that I am going to make my demand of what is due me by praying the word, the scripture promise, and take I believe that I take hold of that promise in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that as I continue to pray, I know that you hear me, and I know that I have what I have prayed, which means all my promises and all that I'm going to pray are going to come to pass. As long as I'm right with God, not wavering, keeping His commandments, doing the things, pleasing in His sight, walking right with Him so my heart doesn't condemn me, so that I have confidence before God. I'm going to have confidence. I'm going to come boldly to the throne of grace. I'm going to pray the word. And I'm going to take hold of all the promises of God and pray it continuously until I see the manifestation. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to have confidence in prayer from this day forward. And I'm going to see my prayers are going to have a response and I'm going to see them come into manifestation as I pray accurately according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. This is revolutionary. I've had people all over the country and the world have told me this absolutely changes the way I, I'm to pray from what I've been praying all my life. And I wonder why I've been never getting anywhere. And they've started to pray this way and the testimony supported in that they've seen God begin to move and respond because they've been praying correctly according to the New Testament, taking hold of the promise instead of continually asking, requesting, petitioning, and waiting and wondering what's going to happen. Waiting, hoping that God will do it. Hoping and praying, you know, as everybody says. I'm hoping and praying. You can hope and pray forever. No, we're going to take hold of the promise and it will come into manifestation. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. We're going to be hearers and doers of your word. Thank you that we're going to pray accurately and effectively and see your promises come to pass in every area of our life. In Jesus' name, amen.